Oh, and with that, we're live. Yo, 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 yo. We're back, guys. This is episode eight. We've got a special Wednesday edition coming at you here at the Knockoff Podcast. Joined by a podcast regular, Danny J. What's up? We've got Tim to my left. Howdy, fellas. The guest we got joining us tonight, uh, he's played 70 rugby tests for Australia. He's uh, 112 Super Rugby Caps. He's the second all-time leading try scorer in World Cup rugby history. Now resides in Toulon, France, applying his craft. Drew Mitchell. Fellas, how are we? What's up, buddy? Thanks, thanks for coming for on. Big no worries. Thanks for having me. That was one hell of an introduction, yeah, man. Thanks, <laughs> Fuck yeah. What, uh, what your Wikipedia page didn't tell us, though, <laughs> you're uh, a four-time Guinness World Record holder. You yeah. want to shed some light on that for yeah, us? Yeah, that's true. I am. Uh, earlier on this year, uh, I attempted eight, eight different Guinness World Records and, um, and was successful in four of them. So I'm now... The Guinness World Record holder, and um, oh, actually two of them I partnered up with with my good mate Makido. Um, one was um, most amount of passes you could have over five minute, over five meters in in one minute uh, without the ball touching the ground. Drop ball. I think we got maybe ninety two passes or something. I'd um, like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the other one, the other one was actually a new one, so um, it was the first time. Actually so somebody had attempted, attempted that one before. Yeah, someone passes. someone uh, held the record maybe at 70, 76 passes, and so we we blew them out of the water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The next one was uh, the most field goals from the 22 meter. Um, Matt literally just had to pass me the balls um, and I hit 29. Uh, really? But the Guinness World Record um, officials gave us a minimum of 25 before it would be recognized. True. So I, I snuck that one through. That one's the easiest. If anyone's out there listening and you can <laughs> hit a field goal, I promise you, you'll get more than 29. So um, there's a Guinness World Record there waiting to be taken from me. Um, was the there a time constraint on that one as well? Yeah, so that was in three minutes. Three, three minutes. minutes. Yes, I mean twenty nine in three minutes. Yeah, it's fine. Easy done. Um, the other one was um, the hundred meter sprint and a pair of clogs. So, <laughs> that's the um, blue ribbon. That's, that's yeah. the one that yeah. I saw on yeah. fucking Instagram. Yeah, that yeah shit so is ridiculous. That's um, the blue ribbon. <laughs> I, they were pretty, uh, pretty uncomfortable. So I it told, looked I, fucking I painful. I told them man. if I don't get it in this first attempt, it's my it's only done. attempt. It's done. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, I guess I'm in a bit of a unique situation. Just you know, myself and Usain Bolt, the only hundred meter world record holder. So, <laughs> oh, um, <shout> out. <laughs> privileged company, y'all. Uh, and the last one, obviously, I'm pretty known for having big arms. Um, <laughs> that, that was sarcastic. <laughs> um, I uh, the most amount of apples you could crush in your bicep in a minute as well. So um, I knocked off fourteen apples. Fuck. 14. Yeah, the previous yeah. record was eleven. How about them apples? Yeah. Look, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the old the old record holder had little pipes, yeah. but you I are simply amazing, yes, as they say. Exactly, yeah. how, how did that n- initiative come about? That was backed by BBC Sports, is is uh, that right? Did, maybe did, Sky Sports, I think. Is, yeah. Was it a bucket list thing with you, where it's you reached out to them, or well, it, it was one thing that I, I watched when I was growing up. Like there's a um, a TV show where you know that people go on and, and was that where the lady lady would like make her eyeballs oh, bulge out of her head and shit yeah 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 we all grew up watching that same one yeah. Yeah. you can't do yeah. that like no that. i mean i can't do that <laughs> but maybe if i see something really shocking maybe yeah. but um yeah. so I, I just sort of threw out there at new year's i said my new year's resolution is to become a guinness world record holder didn't think much of it like i do with most of my news resolutions and maybe a month later um a lady laura jane jones from sky sports kind of got in contact with me and said look if you're serious about it We'll facilitate it um, so long as we can film it and do a bit of it, you know, like a segment type thing for their, their TV program. So, yeah, right. Yeah, the four that I, I failed miserably in um, Jaffa cake eating or something. The record was 18 in a minute. I think I, I was on my fourth. In it a just, I, I've, I've seen the actual footage that Drew's referring to, and they're sort of like eating fucking dry muffins. It just yeah. looked what is a Jaffa torture. Cake? Yeah, it is like it's a bit of a muffin with like, I don't know, this awful draft. It, Jaffa tasting uh, <laughs> jelly in the middle, like <laughs> coated with chocolate or something. Um, yeah, so I only got through about four. It's like it's kind of like I guess the equivalent for us to try and eat wheat bix. You know, one of those real yeah, dry oh, challenges sure. that you just can't sure. do. But another one was um, how many socks I could put on one foot. Um, again, I got maybe half the amount of socks on. But this one again, it's all about preparation. So what you can do is buy in. In advance, you can buy different size socks. So, like, they can progressively get bigger because obviously, the more you put on, the bigger your foot. And uh, mine were all the same size. And by the end, I probably had about 18 on, and my foot felt like it was about to crush. Like, it was <laughs> under so much, like, uh, so, so much pressure. And then uh, another one was I then had to pair those socks, how many pairs I could find in a, in a bundle. Um, like, I go right domestically, but that's that's obviously. So how does it work? Me. This is all like your own initiative. Guinness don't sponsor any of this. You approach Guinness with the like, yeah. with the fucking so idea I, I or whatever. In in the UK anyway, it's eight hundred quid, um, eight hundred pound per attempt. 
Right. Shit. Yeah, and, so uh, it's not like you can just reach out to them and say, yeah, oh, give me a yeah. go, oh, you missed out. So the two officials that came to to adjudicate my um, attempts, they're like full-time employees of Guinness World Records because they have like 55,000 um, record attempts per year. Fuck, imagine that job, man. Just a money-making some machine. Pe- some yeah. people have good jobs, though. That's a sweet job. Yeah. Definitely. I'm going to go watch this dude attempt some stupid shit today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And they, just, they take it so seriously, though. The first guy, actually, sure. was a bit nervous because, um, you know, the cameras are on or whatever, and he said... Uh, Drew, this is an official Guinness World Record attempt. Are you ready? And I said, yes. He's like, three, two, one. And off I go and I'm starting to crush a few of these apples. And I knew that the record was 11. And after five, he said, stop. And I was like, oh, you know, like I'm no chance of getting this. And um, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I stopped the clock after 30 seconds. I was like, mate. You got one job, mate. Yeah, you got one job. (laughs) And he just like froze in the headlights. (sighs) And so I went again and I got 10 on the second occasion. Um, So going back to the before, it's 800 per attempt, but you get three attempts at it. So if you get someone to come out and... And, uh, and watch you try You, you do get three attempts and so Choke on the first out. attempt And yeah. do you die You'd be filthy Yeah exactly exactly. But then <laughs> This guy's a choke artist <laughs> So I knew I knew it was within re- um, Within reach But We'd run out of apples And I just said Look You're going to have to go back To the market Like I need more apples here. Yeah So I mean There's quite a bit of a technique to it Obviously the apples explode on your arm And get slippery for the next one so There was a dude at a, at a kick on once That I was at That um, put out the challenge Who could Crack an egg Between your ass cheeks it's actually not that fucking easy, man. Really? It's like a really, really fucking hard thing to do. Eh? I, I, to any of the listeners out there, I fucking challenge you to try to crack an egg between your ass cheeks. Is the, is the if, problem if, holding if, it there? Or it's just building enough pressure to collapse the egg. You think an egg is, an, is a really delicate thing, but it's actually not, man. Yeah. Have you ever tried to squeeze an egg on the, on the, the vertical axis? No. No, it's actually really strong. It's wow. actually like right. the way that it's set up. No, it's the, super strong. These two boys, Timmy and Drew here, are packing some big booty. I reckon both of those would do it. We might, we might, have, to, we might have to try off yeah. air after this. Yeah. I guess Maybe. the thing about it is if you do succeed, like all you're rewarded with is fucking egg yolk down, <laughs> down your ass yeah. crack. Right? Congrats, man. Look, but at, but at, at any form of kick on, like it's probably going to be the best thing ever too. You got, you got, you got, the, pride of, you got the pride of knowing that too. But yeah. Talk about big asses and moving big tin. Like we're on Fox Sports. Uh, oh, last week, right. yeah, I wanted to bring there was this a, article uh, up. There was an article that we, Danny and I, both read and shared together. Not much of a gym guy myself, but appreciate bikes moving big weight. And there was yeah. sort of a list of who was strongest man. Sort of Fox club, Sports club article club. about yeah, who's who's the strongest in the gym off season and and on season, like in the in the NRL. Fucking Marty to power man, holy yeah. shit, yeah, he's that a big, dude uh, is fucking unit. strong. Pulls a um a three. A three ten kilo deadlift in in off season. Yeah, that that's, that's fucking who enormous. Who's moving some of the biggest tin that you've played with along the way? Now, do you have? Um, you're obviously up there with the squat. You got the yeah. I, got a, I mean, I think for me, the sort of like anything sort of from the the legs and the and the back is probably my go to. I'm I'm a bit of a bench bitch. Like I I don't sort of profess to have any type of chest or arms on me other than the ones that I crush apples with. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> other than the ones I break records. It's all technique, yeah, baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, but I think... You should I, see I, me with an egg in my ass, cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, squat, I probably... my I think the, the most I've lifted is 220. Um, and then just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I punched out a couple... Uh, three reps at 250 in the deadlift. Jeez, so, um, son. Yeah, so... Uh, Getting, getting back to it but it's getting up there have you found you've gotten stronger as you've got older yeah i think also um i think my sort of my body's conditioned a fair bit more to the yeah. training like central I, nervous system yeah when i first started like i couldn't do any olympic lifting because my back was too crook and you know i also when i first started playing a big key area for me was to put on weight and then once yeah. i put on that weight and try and do all the running like my back sort of gave out and it stopped me from squatting and powerlifting and all that sort of stuff for for quite some time but I don't know now it's sort of something I really enjoy. Um, yeah, again, I, I still steer away from the bench because it's not something I'm not lifting big numbers, so it doesn't really excite me too much. Mm. But then when I get in the squat and um, and the deadlift, when I I feel like I can match it with some of the bigger boys, then um, yeah, I, I stick to that. That's something I wanted to ask you about. Like, uh, obviously, you sort of fucking blew up pretty much straight after you left high school. And I mean, most people as they're fucking 16, 17 are fairly scrawny, like, you know, it's still got a basically, you know, an adolescent body. And uh, and it seems like yourself and fucking heaps of dudes who end up making it to those professional levels, 
are are able to put on a massive amount of size in like a, a short amount of time like what are they sort of fucking what's their mo once you leave school like is it just mass calories and training or yeah it's it's a fair bit of um fair bit on the diet really like mm. every, sort of the amount sort of like your intake and um, they just tell you to eat everything yeah. in sight, I mean, I more or less. Sort of or? Pretty much eat something the size of my fist every ninety minutes. Yeah, and it's not so much like a nutritional focus or anything. It's just like get, really. get this in you, get yeah, big, just get, get, in, get formidable big. I mean, on the field. Still, like I mean, we're still doing all the skin fold testing and stuff like that. But True. Um, it's pretty much just yeah, eat what you can, all the supplements and stuff as well. Um, and then, but and, I don't know I think sometimes if you don't get the balance right, um, which is what I found as well. Is so much about get get weight on and because I was playing in the centers as well. My first season Super Rugby, I played mm-hmm. at thirteen, so I was marking up at eighty one kilos against Tanu Munger, who would just like hold cool. me up for fun, you know, like he yeah. just hold me in a tackle, and I just my legs wouldn't even be on the ground, and I wouldn't be able to get to ground and get the ball back. So, um, but then once I put all this weight on, I like my hamstrings and things weren't conditioned to carry yeah. the weight, so I I found myself just tearing them quite a fair bit, like quite a quite a bit early in my career. So it's kind of about you know like building it putting that that weight on but at a sensible rate where your, your body's able to cope with it do they do much like uh mobility work and stuff like that in your guys training more so maybe now than yeah than definitely in the early a days lot, a lot more now um you know yoga and things like that are, are, yeah, are a fairly big part of the training these days but when i first started it was um you know i guess we had all the old school training stretching just, before yeah, and after just, and shit like yeah. here's how you stretch your hammies boys yeah. getting it from like fucking under 12 Pumas coach yeah. who's an alcoholic yeah. fucking yeah. <laughs> like yeah. working at the local factory like yeah. shout yeah. out Pumas we got four generations of Pumas <laughs> right here yeah, yeah represent yeah. represent shout out Les, Les Hughes complex baby that's where it all began <laughs> you touched on you touched on there in your debut season with the Reds playing at 13 in that side you had Wendell Saylor playing outside you Chris Latham at the back yeah is it crazy to transition now if you're a 70 test wallaby mentoring these guys coming through compared to what influence these guys have had on you that must sort of blow your mind to be here a decade later yeah and now you're the, the master of such the teaching guy, the apprentice yeah. yeah i mean i guess for me it was i was in a bit of a i guess a unique situation which what i thought anyway but um through my secondary schooling i looked up to a guy chris latham like he was the guy that i enjoyed watching the most and then first year out of school i found myself training and playing alongside him and learning from him and yeah. um you know so that was kind of cool to you know to have the poster on your wall and then all of a sudden you know you got to take it down because you know yeah, you don't want him to be fucking about weird it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's that's training, but, um, you gotta take that photo out of your wallet <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly I, I took this it down for us chris yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, just um, ultimate test every <laughs> fucking training session yeah. asking for selfies and <laughs> shit like yeah. mate would yeah. you fuck off like no, we're actually, on the same team no, yeah, man. we didn't have camera phones yeah, on first there wouldn't have been a selfie i remember the first photo the phone i had was the the two megapixel Samsung flip. Yeah, so there well, you go. Damn, flip phone. Flip phone. Yeah. Remember those, was it the fucking Ericsson, the silver and black ones? They were like, I remember when it came out, that shit was cutting edge, yeah. man. I remember the I Motorola <laughs> Razor as well. I had the Razor. <laughs> yeah, they were nice and thin, those yeah. ones. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Keep up with those Joneses, baby. Fucking A. But yeah. yeah, then I guess it wasn't really until today or yesterday. I was like, fuck, I'm the old guy. Like, There's only one guy older than me in the squad at the moment, mm. which is Stephen Moore. Um, obviously losing kids uh, a couple of weeks ago, him going back, took another older guy out of the out of the squad and I'm one day older than Adam Ashley Cooper, so another old guy's gone. Um, but yeah, I guess, I don't know, I guess I kind of had a bit of a moment. I never really take myself too seriously, so I don't really ever find myself feeling too old. But then I had a moment where I'm like, fuck, these guys are all 10 years younger than me, you know? Like, like yeah. 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 I, I'm, not, I'm not fitting in here at all. Like, I'm <laughs> yeah. standing over here on my oh, Pat Malone. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you guys want to go down the TAB? Hey, like, wow. <laughs> what? How do you bet? And I'm like, jeez. What have you guys <laughs> been doing <laughs> for the last 10 years? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't your dad teach you that? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I feel my age any time I drink now, man. Like, Or the next day anyway. The hangover has turned into a fucking three-day event. Yeah, yeah it. certainly travelling the next day after a big night out makes it tough. You make your Wallabies debut in 2005. Yeah. You hear 70 tests later. You say you don't take yourself too seriously. You're not thinking about your career as such. That's more something that you're going to reflect on when you hang them up and have an appreciation for it. You're still enjoying the ride for what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I think, you know, my career has taken many a turn. You know, I played for 10 tests in the first year in 2005. Got a pretty rude awakening the next year and didn't, get, didn't even make the 44-man squad because I kind of just assumed things were going to keep panning out the, the way they were. And my training and my play kind of reflected that. And 
I mean, you never like it. I was. I remember driving into Ballymore and the, the Wallaby squad were training, and I hadn't got a call or anything. I'm like, guess I didn't make that. You know, like that's a pretty, um, pretty big, you know, shot to the guts. But at sort of 20, 22, 23 yeah, 20, years yeah, of age, something like that. So I was like, you know, the first I, it wasn't my fault. You know, like it was, mm. you know, obviously the selectors' fault or the coaches' fault. Yeah, man. politics, man. Politics, something like that. But I think you know, <laughs> after a little bit, you know, when I actually sort of had to sit down and think about it, and and really kind of you know ask myself about how much i had actually worked that year compared to what i needed to be doing um it was probably you know like that that sort of kick up the ass that i needed and um you know and then going through like i don't know maybe eight or so years to where i decided to go to france and which meant that at that time i wouldn't play for australia again because of the way the the rules were um and then again to be f- to find myself now back in after another world cup campaign and and back in here again so um i don't know i, I guess it, yeah, like you said it'd be something i look back on once I finish, but I mean, I'm just, I just enjoy it. I think, you know, that's, that's the reason why myself and I'm sure guys like Gitz, Coop and those guys keep coming back is just because we just genuinely enjoy um, the experience that we get. But it's also just like pretty cool just traveling around the world with, you know, 30 odd blokes and um, ones that you go through a fair bit in training and, you know, like negative press and, you know, all that sort of thing. Like you're sort of bound pretty tightly. Yeah. Because of it. And, um, you know, and then when you get those good tires and those results that you've been working for, is um, it's a pretty good feeling to. to is share. there a, is there a time where you thought it was over? It, it, for those listeners that aren't huge rugby fans, in 2011, Drew was involved in a Super Rugby game at Suncorp Stadium here in Brisbane, playing for the Waratahs against the Reds. He was involved in a collision, chasing a ball. Yeah. Uh, what injury occurred? And th- there was a time where you'd received medical advice where it might be all over. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, so I um I just uh, I ran into Scotty Higginbotham. I, uh, the, my right foot, the, the toe got caught in the deck and I went over on it and dislocated the right ankle, um, which at the time was maybe sort of three and a half, four months shy of the World Cup. So, um, you know, like I was not not particularly happy Spirit. with the timing at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, but once I got on the sort of the... the, the whi- morphine whistle, whistle yeah, there. The whistle yeah. sort of <laughs> calmed me down for a bit, but... Um, yeah, and then after that, I, I got I got the screw into the ankle, which was in for ten weeks, and and managed to sort of fight my way back into the Wallaby squad, but just didn't have the running in my legs going into the, to that World Cup. And sure enough, sort of three or four games in the last pool game against Russia, I, I tore my hamstring um, on the other side. Just I think because that was taking the load from uh, you know the right ang- uh, the right leg, which was the injured one, and and it went on me. So I just sort of went home, but I, I felt this um, sort of like a flick like every time I'd, I'd step and it turns out what it was was where the screw was removed the hole that it left in the bone had it sort of healed up but it grew too far yeah. and left like a bit of a sort of like a knob almost like like they explained to me it was basically like a rope over a rock every time I step yeah and then eventually my tib post tendon the one on the inside that keeps the arch of your foot up that ruptured completely so um it's not really something that people my age do um only obviously because I had this sort of um bit of bone that was there yeah and uh the only the only way sort of to come back from that was um, a tendon transplant from underneath my foot. And there'd been no... Um, we'd, we'd spoken to people in America, Europe, UK, everywhere really. Um, and there'd been no known athlete that had come back from it. Um, so, I mean, that was that was all I was... I, I had maybe 15, 20% chance of sort of coming back from it. And um, so then I, I get a call from my manager and he sort of said, mate, um, we got to have a chat. And so we went for coffee and he's like, so life after footy and then that that coffee i didn't i didn't listen i I mean i I listened but i didn't hear anything just like that yeah as you see in the movies where you hear traumatic news and it's just sounds in the i can i can see your mouth moving but there's just nothing there yeah Yeah. exactly i mean i think it was one of those things i just wasn't prepared for because i i felt that you know like it was before my time and fortunately it was before my time but um you know there's been many athlete and and people in other sort of you know works of life that have had to stop doing what they love before uh, before they were ready, but um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a tough period because you know when you rely so much on a team environment to, to pick you up. Sometimes you go into training and feed off other people's energies. When you become when you're injured, you become an individual athlete. You're going in your yeah. rehab, you're doing all that on yeah. your own, and and it's always outside the hours of when the boys are training as well because you need the physios and stuff. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's, it's tough times, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy I came out the other end of it. Two World Cups later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about it. <laughs> what was that feeling like when they, um, or like when they do, when they change the setup so that the the people playing in Europe competitions and shit like that could um, could play for the Wallabies? Yeah, I mean, I, we we'd heard my, when I say we, myself and Matt Giddo were, were we both play in Toulon over in France on the same side, and 
we'd heard sort of rumours that there was potential that they were going to change the rules and whatever else. And we also had a couple of English guys in our squad that there was a lot of chat about them playing as well for, for England. But What was the main driver behind it, do you know? Um, I think basically the new coach came in, Michael Checker, and he just said, look, if I'm going to go to this he World was Cup, pushing for it, yeah. I just want to take the best team I, I right. think possible. And um, and I known I had known, though, that he'd called Gitz a few times and, you know, talking about him coming back and, excuse me, all, all that sort of thing. And uh, and I, every time I'd say, oh, mate, did he, did he mention anything? He's like, no, <laughs> no, he didn't, sorry. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, well, you can tell me, mate. Yeah, <laughs> we're close. We're close. <laughs> but I also <laughs> kind of didn't want to, like, play my cards too much and be, yeah. like, you know, hanging on his every phone mm-hmm. call and so oh, did he sp- did he say anything? Is that Michael? Is yeah. It, is it, is <laughs> that it? Like, no, mate, fuck and then, Is like, it checks? So, so, so basically, <laughs> like, Come on, checks. <laughs> basically, Gitz got told he was coming back and I still hadn't heard a thing. And then I remember we played cast at, um, at home one time and... Um, we had a good win. I came into the dressing room, checked my phone, and there was a, a voicemail from Czech. And normally I wouldn't sort of worry about, you know, like checking all that sort of stuff, you know, for an hour or so after a game or something. But there I just ran straight back into Straight on the Insta, bro. Yeah, I just wanted to see how many yeah. likes you had after the game. Like, yeah. just see, see that fucking try, oh, fam? Mate, so, many, so many boys do that, though. Like, it's funny how, yeah, like, the last thing they do is put their phone down and the first thing they do is pick it back <laughs> up. But, um, All right, check in. Let's see yeah. what the mentions are. Yeah. Oh, oh, shit. I'm, so. uh, I'm, I much prefer to get a green stub in my hand the first thing I do when I walk yeah, into a dressing room. I think that's the, the age gap, too, that you're referring to as well. Yeah, probably. Yeah, the, yeah, the, so, the young social media age. Yeah, you want a tween. You touch on living in Toulon now yep. and Toulon it plays in the French and European rugby competition for all the casual fans and they've basically got a superstar team of all comers from around the world do you remember turning up on your first day there and just seeing these guys that international rugby fans put on a pedestal and all of a sudden you're getting to work with them like the the Johnny Wilkinsons Brian Habanas yep. Bacchus Bothers yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the the team list. Um, certainly, the first year I went was pretty impressive. Like the guys you just mentioned, and um, mind you, I, I'd been in a position where I wasn't able to get a release from my AAU contract, but I also wasn't. They weren't able to pick. Well, you and Mackenzie chose not to pick any of the guys who decide to go to um, offshore, overseas, and play at the end of that year. So we were kind of in a, in a bit of a holding pattern. And like like I said before, I'm much more of a team type trainer. So I was sort of left to my own devices for about three months and i'd been to a fair few long lunches rather than long runs and so i turned up i turned up at Toulon and they were expecting a wing and i think they probably saw more of a prop and um so the reception i got was probably a little bit different had i turned up actually fit but um you know i remember one guy in particular levan chiluchava he's a a georgian prop real hairy guy you know like (laughs) balding and all that and he he just told me straight up he said i won't talk to you until you lose five kilos I was like, who, who fucks this bloke? I was like, yes, is this bloke kidding? Like, we're sort of back at the bus, like, found my seat next to Gitz, and this guy's sort of sitting opposite me, and he's, no, I won't talk to you until you lose five kilos. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, like, this is this is a bit rich. Because this guy's also a prop. Like, he, yeah. he, he's, he's got five lo- kilos to lose himself. <laughs> and then, to make things worse, I find out the bloke's 22. Like, he, like a you know, Georgian boy, real, real hairy, balding, and whatever, big unit, but... And he looks, you know, like... He's a pup. He looks a fair bit younger, yeah. oh, older, but... Yeah, and this 22-year-old having a go at me as well. I was like, what? And uh, as it turns out, I got to know him a little bit better and it just turns out to be his type of humour and he's probably one of the guys I get along with most uh, now in Toulon, but at first... Like, had he been a bit smaller, had he been a halfback, I might have actually had got in my first fist fight. <laughs> true, <laughs> true. Uh, he just called me out in is, front of everyone. I was like, jeez, mate, like, I don't really need that when I first arrive. Yeah. Is, is there any inter- internationals amongst the Toulon roster that you'd played against and maybe had something in your head like, oh, this fucking guy, like, oh, oh, and you've turned up on, on and sort of formed relationships and went, hang on, this guy's a, an yeah. absolute legend. Yeah, I think... Um, you Anybody know, like, you want to throw under the bus being a fuckwit, <laughs> yeah. man? Uh, <laughs> allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. Formed good relationships with everyone but this dude, man. Yeah. Holy shit. When so I just <laughs> want to make it clear I'm calling out you, dog. Yeah. <laughs> No, when I uh, when I come back on this podcast in a year or so, when I've left the line, I'll definitely throw a few. <laughs> Bear in mind, I've got to go back there in a few weeks. So, um, episode <laughs> fucking two hundred and thirty-seven, fam. Watch out. Yeah. Um, no, but I think guys, you know, guys who play like quite abrasively and, and aggressively, you can kind of form an opinion of what they may be like off the field. Like Bucky's both, he plays the game harder than anyone you've probably ever seen. Always. Seems to be in the thick of it, you know, fighting bikes, but then blowing a kiss just to really get under their skin. And um, he's always, you know, he's 
he's got that many yellow cards and red cards mm. waved at him. Like, I don't know if there's anyone that can match it. But then you, you, you meet him and he's, he's one of those guys that sort of shakes your hand and, um, you know, he's got a huge mitt, but his second hand will sort of wrap up that, that handshake as well. Like, it's just a really genuine uh, handshake. But then he's just like a quite a... I don't know, like he just doesn't take things too seriously either. He's always, ah, is it my Aussie, my Aussie boots? You know, just, <laughs> and he, he will, like him and Juan Smith, the other African boys, they make their own bourrevost, like the, the African sausage and, and bring it in for all the boys. And, um, you know, and the, or they'll, they'll cook up a bra after, after training and things. And, you know, like really kind of, um, yeah, like accommodating and like, you know, really quite, quite inclusive and, uh, and just don't t- take things anywhere near as seriously as you probably would think they would, um, you know, just by watching them play. Yeah. Do you think that's a, a, another generational thing? Like you see it in the league fucking heaps now where it's like if somebody makes a mistake, the op- opposition's jeering them up like, the, ah, you fucked up. Yeah, the, like, the, ta- the taunting sort of is... Uh, taunting, like all Sturlow and that fucking hate do. it because like, the, they're so old school. All like. the old school blokes and even a sport if you transition to the NFL, if you go up to someone after they've made an inf- like, uh, enforced error you'll get a taunting penalty, which would be yeah. five yards against you. And I think the NRL these days are looking to go against that because it, it is somewhat of bad sportsmanship. There's a, there's a time where you can throw chat yeah, and there's a time where you're just sort of rubbing it in someone's yeah. face. And well, I think um, we saw it just last weekend. Uh, Andrew Fafita made a mistake late in the game against Melbourne Storm and they, two young guys had a go at him. And they did. Craig, Bell- Craig Bellamy came out and said that that's not, um, that's not part of who we are. And no. he said he'll have a, a bit of a stern talking to those no. guys. So I think it's still good that... Um, like there are guys that are wanting to make sure it doesn't become a thing mm. in the game, and and it's not just that game. I think it's in all all sports as well that you just. I mean, you don't need. I love I love a, a bit of a sledge, and I love it when someone hits me with a good sledge. Where I don't. I can't really say too much about. But um, you know, I think it, when it becomes, I don't know. I just think sometimes like if you see someone make a, a mistake, then they know, you know they fucked eat, up, yeah, man. They that's know. that's the long and the short yeah. of it too. You're playing in a, a stadium sport in front of 25,000. Yeah. They yeah. they're going to remind you more so than others. I was an absolute fucking rubbish rugby union player, but um played played ARC for a, one, played baby. for a couple of years like as a teenager and uh played one competition, this school competition of league, and I remember making the fucking transition, man, and it was like I had dudes like after a tackle, dudes would just fucking rub your head into the ground and like elbow your fucking head. And I was like, mate, fucking calm down, would you? And I remember this one guy, like, I'll fucking never forget the quote till the day. He was like, it's fucking footy, mate. And I was just like, would you fucking chill out, dude? Like, what's with the grappling on my fucking head, man? Like, that's, you, that's the absolute I'm held. difference. I'm held, bro. <laughs> Drew, I just want to go back to what you said before with the comments about sledging. Uh, can you divulge any uh, any any all time sledges that have been laid laid your way, either from the crowd? There would have had to have been a couple of a couple of come from the crowd when you're standing back on the sideline or marking your wing. Um, or, or does that not just become? No, I think some stick out. I remember going back again to that injury. I um I was on the back of the uh, the medicab after I'd sucked on that whistle a bit. And I was going off the ground up the tunnel at Suncorp Stadium and just waving to everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I was wiping my tears off to oh, be honest. No. But um, Sorry, I was no. going up the tunnel and I, I remember <laughs> this one guy sort of stood over the fence line and said, "I hope it hurts and it hurts all year." Yeah, and then kind of said, to, you know, like a pretty inflammatory um, yeah, name at, at the end of it. But I was thinking, mate, I'm, I'm pretty down and out here. Like I don't know if that's necessarily that's you. K- you kicking, know, him, like kicking him in while you're down. The way I go about things, but um. No, I think Wendell Saylor was always pretty good. Um, you know, I, I remember being alongside him um, in games and um, he, uh, you know, a young bloke would try and, and try and lip him up and he'd just go, hang on a minute. He'd just say, stop, stop, stop. Can you just get me a, men- uh, can you just get me a program? I've got to see, see what this bloke's name is. He said, I don't even fucking know you, mate. Don't even talk to me. <laughs> you know, and then move him on pretty quickly. But I remember also another time when, when Dell moved to the Waratahs and I was still playing for the Queensland Reds. Uh, we kicked off to him and he was coming back and I just knew from playing with him so much that he just really liked to dominate that left foot step and uh, and sure enough he kind of went off it a few times to to get his big frame to straighten up and he got too many ta- and he went off his left again and I tackled him I said fuck Dell you got to get something more than that left foot step mind you we're laying on the ground now I said you got to get something more than just that left foot step and then he just went and just whacked me straight in the eye, <laughs> and I was oh. like, "Oh, you grub!" Like, you know, oh, big deal. <laughs> and we got up and we threw back going. to the Broncos. But or? I tell you now, his wife Tara, she obviously like, um, you know, I, I know her really well as well. And um, and I told her the story one time. We we're in a Wallaby camp just after it that year, 
And still to this day, whenever we all catch up, I'll, I'll say, Tara, do you remember that time when Wendell hit me in the face? <laughs> and then she'll like give him a bit of a smack as well. I was like, how could you do that to little Drewy? Because obviously she still sees me as that young 21-year-old, but um, yeah, a bit old of it. Man, he's still still maintained that he's one of my favourite personalities in all of you the, are, the footy sports. You read his autobiography cover to cover, didn't I you? I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I did, did read Dell's autobiography. He's, oh, yeah. um, it's it, amazing it, how many sentences oh. start with like, we were young. Handsome, fit. Yeah. But I think if I think he refers to city rollers at least fifteen times in there, like just a couple of young fit blokes turning up. The women were all into us. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's just, he's shout a, out Big Dell. You gotta a, love yeah. Big Dell. Absolutely, yeah, man. He's, he's a flamboyant character, and I still really rate him on the game. And another guy I've really warmed to over the years too, as a passionate New South Wales fan, come state of origin. So you're talking before about sort of misconceptions. Do you think this about backies, or you, you yeah. think this about other players? I've really warmed to Gordy Tallis when he's got his media career behind him now I religiously podcast the uh, Triple M Sunday NRL and they just sort of talk about the games over the weekend and yeah, sure. really really rate Gordy's opinions too I, I'd love to uh, love to get him on so once this is out there too we'll get Wendell first and then we'll get Gordy the week after that so <laughs> shout out yeah I'm pretty sure my ex-girlfriend used to cut Gordon Tallis's hair man so I'll have to uh, get in contact with her so, <laughs> so na- naturally she's out of work now <laughs> so, <laughs> so, no, sorry about it Sorry about a big raging bull. No, no sweat. <laughs> Would have taken all of about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, mate, we're at the knockoff here too. We're sort of, we theme ourselves as a sort of lifestyle spec storytelling. Sports and top. recreation, yeah, dog. A- absolutely. That's the one. If you're <laughs> searching for us on uh, SoundCloud, like that's how you know how yeah, to find sure. us. Um, we always talk about UFC and we're passionate mixed martial arts fans here. Yeah. Um, is that something many of the boys in the in the team are into? Is it sort of it's caught on with amongst that group also? Yeah, definitely. I think it's um, I think also being uh, at Toulon there, we've got so many different nationalities as well, and you know, obviously, the popularity in UFC and mixed martial arts at the moment, there's there's fighters popping up from all around the world. So there's usually someone in our team that's got someone on the card, like different different fighters on a card that you know we kind of come up against someone else in our team. So it's um, you know, it's pretty pretty cool and, and unique in that sense, but. There are many times where, you know, we'll get we'll we'll finish an away game and uh, we basically get straight onto onto the bus as soon as we get out of the dressing room. So we have maybe a six seven hour bus trip, and then because of the time difference between us and and America, most of the time, um, you kind of get home around three or four in the morning, and that's when you're hitting straight into, you know, like a UFC oh, event. Perfect. So we kind of you know we'll have a pretty pretty wet um, bus trip home with yeah. a few beers or red wines or rosés or whatever it might be, Is that and then win, uh, win lose or draw. Um, it's normally win, but yep. um, yeah. depends how quickly the. Well, actually, our coach normally just stayed in Paris, like, or he just travelled to Paris after a game because his family were there, and he wouldn't turn up until maybe a day or two before the game. So, um, probably a pretty big reason why we didn't do that well last year. But um, <laughs> he's under the bus this week. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Shout out, head coach. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's gone now, Bernard Laporte. Oh, oh come yeah, on, so there we are. Right. Uh, well, but uh, you justified it. That's yeah, fine. So <laughs> normally, if the coach isn't there, then we, uh, you know, we, we don't mind it so much. But um, uh, to be fair, it's not as uh, it's not as strict over there as it is back home. So um, drinking, you know, obviously, you know, a, re- a respectable amount is uh, is a pretty common thing. Yeah, so you're you know, still professional athlete. So- the southern, the s- no, not really, but so <laughs> 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 the south of France. I think you know, it's kind of, it's quite common to kind of train in the morning, have a bottle of rosé at lunch, and then. Shoot back to training in the afternoon. I think My children kind of, need a wine. Yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just a kind of part of the part of the culture, and you know, I'm all about going over there for the culture. So yeah, that's it. Who am I to say no to a glass of rosé? <laughs> you know? That's a pretty special opportunity that you've had, where you think you've got you've got the African guys that embrace their own culture while they're over there, and you get to experience so many things in the one place. It's yeah, like yeah, I mean, we I have car- become a carbonized better person. the Fijians, and um, yeah. you know, like a lot of the George, like I'll go and have a. Like a nice little cognac and a and a, a like a cigar with the Georgians. <laughs> true, um, true. They're the ones. Like a little that, microcosm. Yeah, they're the yeah. boys you want on your side. They're, they're just yeah. men, those yeah, guys. Yeah, <laughs> serious they're men, those boys. And uh, you know, I mean, where the fuck is Georgia? Excuse yeah. my geographical Eastern ignorance. Europe. Eastern oh, European. Oh, yeah. Any any is that time accurate? you're thinking so, yeah. about something like that, yeah. you've got to say Eastern European. Well, what I'm saying is they look at that's Yeah, like, I mean, I know off, that off their, their biggest rival is Russia. So Yeah, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Like, I know that they've got like a second tier Six Nations that they're involved in and each player for them get 50,000 euro if they win against Russia. 50,000 euro? Georgia have never lost to Russia. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Pride on the line there. Yeah, and they, they, they have 60,000 at those games. So you're, you're wow. at... You're at Toulon now. Yeah. 
geographically in France, where is that sort of? Uh, south of France on the Med Med side. So we're between um, Nice and Marseille, pretty much in the middle of uh, of that. So about thirty five minutes from Saint Tropez. So we're in a pretty oh, nice part. Sounds of the world. awful. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I, I unfortunately I've had to come back for um, my rehab and stuff, and I missed the entire summer, but. It is, um, and a little boat trip from uh, Corsica, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah just a nice little boat trip over <laughs> nice there. Nice googling there, Dan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, seriously. Oh, so. oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's one of the great spots. The the is med it? is like as as far as like I've travelled to Europe, Central America, North America, Southeast Asia. That's about the extent of my travels. I haven't found a place better than the med, man. Fucking yeah. amazing yeah, paradise. It's a good spot. Spent like about three months in uh, Palma de, de Mallorca. Fucking yeah. Oh, rugby is the only sport in Toulon. Do they have a football franchise? Rugby seems the most popular. It seems almost religion there. I think we've got a. Um, I think we've got a basketball team. Uh, I'm not too sure what. Um, it's basically, like the NBL. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Um, Who cares, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Your words, not mine. But, uh, I mean, the, the big football teams around us. Um, uh, Marseille. Marseille's probably got the biggest following. Um, in French football, uh, although Paris Saint Germain, mm. you know, clearly the better side at the moment. But I think there's a pretty big injection of cash into Marseille just recently, so uh, I think they'll spend up pretty big. Um, there's also the Monaco um, football side, which is only another half hour past Nice. So um, we also we have a fair bit of interest from uh, from Monaco in in uh, in Toulon as well. We kind of that's like the whole that sort of province areas is all um, sort of under. Yeah, it's like being it's a Queensland like Reds fan sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, Everyone exactly, North yeah. Queensland to down there. Which is also nice when, uh, you know, the Prince comes along to the games and you get to know him and a couple of his offsiders and then all of a sudden you find yourself on a nice yacht in the Med and, oh. and uh, yeah, it's all... Stop all, it. All, or at the Grand yeah. Prix in Monaco or things like that. So Georgia is wedged between Russia, Armenia and Turkey. It's definitely Eastern European. Yeah, that that fucking is. explains a lot right there. Yeah. So I, what's the fucking, what's the lifestyle comparison like you know, playing rugby in in the south of France versus you know WA and and New yeah. South Wales and the I other places. I think just culturally, I think like they work to live. Like whereas I feel like here, a lot of people like live to work. You know, like I think a lot of people here kind of, it's the same thing. Sort of you know like nine to five or whatever, grind every day of the week, and then you know the same sort of thing of a night just to wake up and do the same thing again, and then the weekend comes around and and then they. But whereas over there, I don't know. I mean. I mean, it's, I know it's rich for me to say when I'm kind of not really working much at all, but um, but over there they kind of, I don't know. I think they just really like to enjoy everything they can, and especially the best parts of the day. So I mean, the siesta certainly, um, you know, fits in well with that type of lifestyle. Mm. If you're drinking a bottle of rosé at lunch, yeah. is fucking fair enough yeah, to have a little I sleep think, afterwards. Then also everything, you know, your schools and everything are, are closed Wednesday, so it's only sort of like a four day week for everyone and. Um, can't get dinner till like ten thirty at night. Yeah, you can't get dinner till <laughs> quite late. Like, but that's just kind of how it tired, is. Man. Yeah, everyone just, <laughs> and it's just really chilled. I think you know everyone spends their time on the beach when the weather's good, and especially you know like down where we are, like weather's good quite a lot of the time of the year. So, um, but yeah, I think just from where I am in terms of um, like footy compared to where I played over here, um, we're just a one team town. So everyone is completely behind us, and and you, and you can feel that when we're going around and. Um, there was my first year there we won both the, the european championship and the top 14 the french championship in consecutive weeks and we flew back down into toulon and, and boarded a boat and went around into the into the port and there was over 110,000 people waiting for us on the port just like going absolutely nuts and mm. it was probably one of the best experiences i've i've uh, experienced within my rugby career was just coming back there and we all we had the trophies and we'd had you know Let's be honest, we had a couple of solid nights under our belt already. But <laughs> so we were on, should have on top, Yeah, exactly. And then we kind of you know, found ourselves on a balcony overlooking like this sea of people that were just all singing the team songs and things. And then we're on the back of a truck going through all these people and everyone was throwing drinks up to us. And it was just like a really cool experience and to see how much it meant to, to all them as well. I mean, we're like, it's quite a working class town, Toulon. And, um, you know, where, you know, to, to fork out a few hundred euro a year to for a season pass is is quite significant and you know for them to come out and sort of see us and and um we kind of had that success that we had how much it meant to them um you know it was was pretty special and uh, alternatively when we haven't gone so well how much it also means to them as well and you know there've been plenty of times where i've been walking down the the grocery store and they'll either give you like a real big pat on the back and tell you played really well 
But if you don't play well, they're also just as forthcoming to tell you that you can't like catch shit. a football. <laughs> Let's see if you can catch a rock. Yeah. And unfortunately for me, I don't understand everything that they say, but you can definitely tell by the, their body language. Yeah. And, and so, have you tone. had to to learn a bit of French, or did you? Is that part of any any of the? Yeah. So we all have to. Um, any foreign that comes in, you have to take lessons. But right, it's is this like a one-on-one thing or a class no, thing? No, it's like five so boys in, and one teacher. You're in a yeah, class yeah. with fucking the rest of your yeah. teammates, <laughs> like, like, like it's school. fucking <laughs> grade ten all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Who had the dunce hat on? Um, <laughs> Ali Williams couldn't pick it up. Ali oh, Williams, no, former All Black, right. um, one of the great guys, and he just he kept us. Like he kept, <laughs> he slowed us down. He, I'm going to say now the reason I'm not Under fluent is because Ali Williams was the class clown and to to disguise his lack of learning, he would just try and uh, make him paper wasps and shit, yeah. <laughs> slow the teacher up or yeah. But um, no, it was, I mean it's good fun. But then I, I went and um, got some private tutoring for a little bit. But any time I'd stop, I'd feel like I'd have to go back and start right from scratch. So I yeah. kind of just I end up um, we had to provide evidence that. Um, you know, proof that we were going out of our way to learn the language, and um, I end up getting one of the strength and conditioning coaches' wives' um, sort of uh, like language card, like where basically she bought ten hours, and every time she went in, they'd sign off, you know, like one hour, hour and a half, whatever, but didn't have her name on it. So I just took that in and, <laughs> and pretended that it was mine, and, uh, and they were they were they were happy enough, and they just obviously thought I was pretty slow at learning it, but I just went back and gave it back to. Um, Bobby, Paul Stridgen's our, our strength and conditioning coach's wife. and uh, But they all thought I was learning it, but just not picking up that well. The stre- strength and conditioning coach at Toulon, is he he has, what well, we're martial arts fans, as you know, he has a wrestling background. Yeah, so shit, Bruce. He, Where are you pulling this he, shit he from? Do, he That's does. Yeah, he outrageous does knowledge. <laughs> we, we have spoken <laughs> in the past about this guy, but absolute Fair character, enough. but he, he has a wrestling background. Is he Greco yeah. guy? Or? Yeah, I think Greco, he, he was in uh, the Commonwealth Games in, I think maybe 2004, could be wrong, but in Edinburgh, I think. Um, yeah, and like a quite a, I don't know, maybe 65 kilo um, weight division and, and went pretty well, I think, but then... He just knew there wasn't a huge amount of cash in it um, at that point. Anyway, he, he would have liked. He, I mean, I've spoken to him a number of times, and he said, "Mate, I mean, he's got a real yeah. northern English accent." G- give mate, it to mate, us, mate, mate, give mate, it to mate, us. Mate, yeah. fuck me, mate, fucking mixed martial arts was around my time, mate. Mate, fucking hell, mate, I would have fucking banged some people, me, mate. <laughs> uh, so fucking anyway, yeah. Toyota Kluger. Michael Bisping, yeah. who? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I've you know, I'm a, I've got thirty kilos on the bloke, and I've tried to wrestle him a few times, and. Within seconds, I'm on my back tapping out. Like he's he's right? still very good. Yeah. And he's you know he's he's obviously like he's not in shape in any means. Like he's not out of shape either, but he's not in his sort of fighting weight. But he's no matter how big the boys are, he's just very good at his technique stuff yeah, and, and all that. It. But then he kind of you know like we do a little bit of that at training, and he'll impart that sort of knowledge because a lot of it as well for us is body positioning and you know getting into a good position on the ground, but also getting it's slowing the ball down and knowing where to grab guys and and how to slow them down or which you know like stopping them from rolling back to to their side of the um you know the ruck and things like that so michael um, hooper baby yeah, okay. yeah he's good yeah. <laughs> unbelievable he's won Shout what did out. he win another waratahs player of the year this week yeah, too it's unprecedented yeah. what he's done i was, I was talking to him actually he's won it now for the last four years and unfortunately it's the Mac, matt burke cup and unfortunately matt burke's been sick the last four years come on yeah, I know. don't tell me that i i matt burke you know how you grow up and you're a passionate for, sports fan my name was matt yeah <laughs> that's his name was matt that's his as much name, of a link as i need his last name started with b i was b i kicked goals at both, your names, Pumas. <laughs> both your names end in e as well oh I didn't Burke, that's Rice. another one holy shit man. is there any way i can meet him man <laughs> it could orchestrate it yeah right. make an acrostic poem out of I your think name think and send sick. it to him man. <laughs> 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 that dude could play though man but hey, see it must must be tiring reading all that news on channel 10 though eh? like yeah. he probably felt a bit no, under weather about to be fair i think he's actually on his book tour at the moment trying to sell his book so is that right yeah, I'll, I'll have to look that up. If he's in Brisbane, I'll, you know I'll swing by. <laughs> yeah. You reckon you'll read that one cover to cover? I would. Right? If I gave Della crack, I better give him a go. <laughs> uh, I'll read them all. Mark Hunt, Wayne Carey, you name it. I've, I've done it. Yeah. But Wayne Carey was, if I can recommend one on air to, to sports fans, Wayne Carey's an Australian AFL player. And uh, if you like listening to, like, like reading books about characters in sport, there's one right there. He had a, yeah. one of his famous stories out of his book, Wayne Carey was known for enjoying a drink and he was part of a North Melbourne team that was like won premierships and he was one night they played on a Friday night and he was the captain of the side but he was also the social captain but yeah. he kept by the rule and I don't know you've probably played with guys like this too where 
they'll party hard, but he'll be the first guy at training and be the last to leave. Yeah. He went to Crown Casino in Ben Mel- Cousins was apparently like that as well. Absolutely, I, I bet he was. Like, just didn't switch <laughs> off at all. Absolutely, was man. I was there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't realize you're a no, WA bro, guy. Like, I know, okay. man. I know. He was man. Trust me. <laughs> so it, Kerry was in like one of the stories out of his book was he was from like he was in Crown Casino after a Friday night game, and gets on the source as hard, as hard as ever. Knows he doesn't have to report to training until Monday, and. He sees a couple of guys from Essendon in the casino and he wanders up to him going, hey, boys, like, fuck, what, what are you doing here? Don't you guys have to play tonight? Where he's been there since after Friday. You go, King, King Kerry, mate, what, what are you talking about? It's, uh, it's Sunday night. Like, we, we played last night. It's like, all right, I'll show myself out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably the difference between the 90s drinking culture in yeah. professional sports environments. Yeah. To these yeah. days, it would be no, so I heard, I heard some story on, about um, fucking Andrew Johns waking up Daniel Johns <laughs> like yeah. in, in on like a Newcastle kick on like Mad Monday oh, wow. spec or whatever. Like Daniel Johns, the silver chair, fucking yeah. <laughs> like wakes up with fucking Andrew Johns on the end of his bed, like just charged, like let's fucking hit the pub. Post grand final, <laughs> Joey sets up the pass inside to Darren Albert on the last play of the game. <laughs> Scores the match winner and then all of a sudden he's waking up the lead singer of yeah. Silverchair the next morning <laughs> saying, come to Marathon Stadium, come to Mad Monday. So, wow. Yeah. You, you need to write yourself a book is what I'm saying once you just do decide to hang What do you reckon out. are the top three sports autobiographies that you've read if you had to put, put not, them in a list? Not Adam Gilchrist. <laughs> no. So PG, mate. Like he'd never done anything wrong in his life, Gilly. Yeah. I, I, and I loved Gilly. But he just he just sort of towed the company line with it. I'd really wish he'd sort of let his hair down with it. Yeah, I feel like those guys. Um, when I say those guys, people who feel like they can't tell the entire story or the you know, all the detail that yeah people essentially people want to hear that detail. If Definitely. you're not prepared to to say it, then don't write a book. I reckon. That's yeah. right. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't write one because I'd probably throw too many under the bus, <laughs> including myself <laughs> and all the rest of it. So I, I'd have to maybe just do one like a, a book of short stories and just make. People have different names, maybe, or something. A book too. of aliases. Just yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> Come out with an audio book or something, too. But it's called Allegedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah too. We'll, for the sake we'll of sponsor the it on the knockoff. You can just do it <laughs> verbatim, fucking oral, fucking. For the sake of this exercise, let's call him Pat Mido. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Listen. So, not Adam Gilchrist? No, yeah, not Adam Gilly. Uh, definitely enjoyed Wayne Carey's. Uh, enjoyed Mark Hunt, UFC, current UFC fighter, heavyweight. His his childhood Would growing you say up. Would he's a UFC fighter? Or is he done with UFC now? I oh, know. I know he's still mixed yeah, martial hey. art. Is he done with the UFC? He, he was fucking spewing yeah. after that. I mean, fight, he was. Man. I thought he made a good point. Just sort of. No, no. Oh, yeah. Feel the, free. The bio yeah. thing, but I thought he made a good point about you know as, as dangerous as a sport as mixed martial arts is. Is someone's going in there juiced up the eyeballs and the. And the organisation aren't doing enough to kind of rule it out or st- or sanction him or or stop him from doing it again. That's like for me, that's poor sort of duty of care. It, and it was the third time that it happened to him too. It's the yeah. third time where a, a, an opposition fighter is pissed hot for steroids against Mark oh, okay. Hunt in his career. I thought you were saying the third time Brock had pissed no, hot. No, 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 third time where Hunt has gone in against an opponent who has failed after the fight, and we we've talked about it on on air on the podcast before and. Brock just failed the eye test for me for that. I don't fight. know if it I mean, was. Yeah, I, I, I don't I've know seen, if it was the the changing from the long boardies to the short shorts. But yeah. he looked in the best fucking shape yeah, he has ever looked in his life. He was shredded, man. A, a two hundred sixty five pound man who had to cut weight to get with to that abs. point with a with a V around his abs that fucking. <laughs> I know some hot model of some variety would some enjoy hot Calvin <laughs> Klein, <laughs> Klein model, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some like Tyson Beckford character or something. I don't know. <laughs> some dream boat. This podcast just went in a real weird yeah. direction. Yeah. So like, why are you looking at photos of male models with their gear off, and why do you know their names? Like, I don't know. Um, my missus is a search history man. Like, I swear. But um, yeah, apparent and apparently he had very little communication with the UFC after that. They kind of just you know threw him that fight. Brock pissed hot. Not really any follow up as to an apology or yeah. anything like that. So he has every right to be um, yeah. to be pissed off about that I mean, situation. Everyone's sort of seen, you know, what damage sort of these guys can do, Fucking and nice. also what damage is like one punch can do. And if like he made the point, what if I something serious had happened to me and no one can support my family? Like I think that's, you know, the UFC should have should have and needed to do more. Yeah, after that. And well, to, to not even receive a phone call as well. You did right, Danny. Where 
not not even Dana or one of the owners reached out saying, "Hey, look, sorry, th- this was an oversight on our behalf." Yeah, it, we yeah. apologise. Like, look, we you know we've got the testing in place now to try and counteract that. We'll yeah. try our best in the future to not even receive a phone call when he is a company guy. And I think that's on. why the the PED conversation is so pertinent to the UFC is because you know it it exists across all sports. Like we've discussed, you know, when we were going into the Olympics, we talked about you know the first instance of people pissing hot in the olympics was like mexico in the 80s or something like that so it's been around for fucking ages but the mixed martial arts thing is different to just a competitive sport in that people are fucking trying to end each other people are trying to fucking hand-to-hand combat do really fucking significant damage to each other to the point where it's you you could kill somebody with your bare hands so it makes that it makes that conversation a whole lot more important i think and that's and that's sort of what you're alluding to but yeah i think mark has every right to be pissed off about that and uh you know you you look at those instances and you're like fuck did the ufc know about that potentially like Mm. i don't know we've we've discussed it ad nauseum on on the podcast but you know the amount of the the delay in time that there exists between these guys are fighting yet the test in in july yet the test was in june and shit it's like that doesn't that doesn't make sense but if you were if you were fighting what you're walking around at probably like 95 kilos. Now Wikipedia like says 92. Be, how how accurate uh, is that, no, Drew Box? Yes, I was 94. Oh, okay. 94. Yeah, so every bit of sort of 208, 209 pounds. That, you know, uh, you know, hop in against John Jones, you reckon? That sushi before you cut, the cut uh, weight podcast. Down. Cut, fucking <laughs> cut, carved him up. Yeah, cut, <laughs> cut weight back down to fight Weidman or Anderson at, uh, say, yeah, mid- I, middle I, weight. I definitely have to try and cut weight, but I, to be honest, I'm... I'm not that kind of beast, you know. Like, <laughs> I've done a bit of mixed, but uh, if, uh, <laughs> yeah, a bit of mixed. I, I think if I was to say, shout out to Cookie, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. The last time I've, we've seen uh, we've seen do, Drew do a little bit of grappling, it was Tim and I's house, probably the best part of five years ago, where we had. For anyone shout who out. listened to uh, episode three, the guy talking about complimenting his boss's wife's titties. Uh, Drew's actually choked him out before. <laughs> he did <laughs> eight eight times, if I'm right. Too Brad. Brad had been to a couple of grappling classes and. No, so that was the second time Brad received a beat down. <laughs> One yeah. for complimenting somebody's <laughs> wife and uh, <laughs> the second time for talking himself up. So he, you choked him out a bunch of times. Is there anyone that comes to mind that you've played with where you'd be horrified to get locked in a cage with them? That just seems like a natural or... Um, I think sort of physique-wise... Um, uh, I know, we, I we had a, doesn't uh, always tell the story of it, um, it, it you know, do, it no, Cain like, Velasquez is not a f- uh, you know yeah, yeah, genetic true, yeah. freak, but yeah, but I mean, I think that. more just like <laughs> just in terms of the power to weight ratio, I think Tatafu plotter now would be. Oof, I mean, nightmare. Turns out he's probably got a bit of a glass jaw, but <laughs> 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 he's been cussed a few he's times. Been to sleep a bit, bit. Um, but I think also David Pocock. I think he's just one of those guys. He he, he puts his body through like absolute torture year in year out and it just doesn't ever bother him no never never sort of i think also his temperament is really good like he's an incredible guy isn't he yeah. what's what's he like as you know like as a general sort of guy in the team is he does he stand out as somebody who's who's different from the pack a little bit like he definitely does yeah, I mean, his I, own I thing i guess he's different because he's he just he knows who he is what he stands for and he stands really strong by sure. that. um he, he's one of those guys that Without meaning to, he makes you feel like a bit of a lesser bloke because he's so perfect. Like he, he almost seems that way. You know, like he's he's a genuinely nice guy. He stands up for, you know, like um, you know, so human rights really, and things like yeah, that. Is really yeah, key issues. Yeah. Well spoken. He just doesn't back down from them, and he's really well spoken. But he's also really well ed- educated on those issues as well. It's not yeah. like he's just sort of he's doing some sort of like political wagon. science degree now or something, yeah. isn't and he? He's yeah, got yeah. It, like you know, he's got his own charity that's um functioning up over in in Zimbabwe where he's from and. Um, you know, he's just one of those guys that's sort of ticking all the boxes, mm-hmm. and uh, he also just happens to be a really good rugby player as well. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> played against him once. Yeah, for maybe like ten minutes or something like that. That was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> avoided, avoided him. At, avoided him I was at like, all yeah, costs. I'm pretty. I'm good for rugby. You know, he's like, just I'm, got, probably, I'm probably just going to drink beers on Friday instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got a real, got like real long reach. Um, he, like I said, he just wouldn't stop until you know, like. The time's up, or you've, or you've, yeah. or you've kill or be killed, man. Kill, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, and his temperament—he just, no matter what happens to him, penalised or you know, someone does a cheap shot on him or whatever, he never, he'll never blow up. He keeps his calm, and I feel like in the octagon that'd probably be a yeah, pretty key thing, yeah. you know, like just to be able to stay focused on what he's going. And that's what you is. see from these real high-level guys. It, it doesn't 
become like a super emotional thing for them and i think uh you know in the beginning of women's mma that's what you saw a lot like a lot of vested emotion with the with the girls and it was almost sort of like oh shit this is a bit rough to watch whereas you watch a practitioner like anderson silver or something go about his business and he's having fun in there man he's in flow and it's like he knows these movements so much that it just becomes second nature to him and that's that's, I think, when it's beautiful to watch any kind of, you know, athletic prowess take place is when somebody's in flow, like we were, I think we were talking about it with Pat Moore last week, actually. Most definitely. All sort of athletics like that as well. It's sort of a, do you have much to do with sports psychologists working in your team, like rehabbing from your injury? Did you have yeah. to approach anyone to say, look, I've lost my mojo a little bit. Can you steer me in the right direction? We asked Simon that question and he said a lot of, Indiv- his is more an individual sport so there's probably yeah. a lot more of those aspects to his sport but does it translate um, to rugby i mean it's definitely on offer and some guys um use it a little bit more than others and it wasn't really something i'd i'd really um thought about it too much because you know i wasn't sort of getting hung up on things too much um you know for a fair, fair while there but it was when i was injured i had a like a lot of um I don't know, I guess baggage from the actual injury myself I, itself by, by looking down and seeing my foot facing the wrong way. That kind of had more of an impact on me probably than physically. Um, to the point where even when I started coming back and playing, I'd be on the bus on the way to the game and people would come and sort of jump up and bang on the side of the bus or whatever when we were going to a test match. And I would just like envisage them like falling over and breaking their ankles or like yeah, I just right. saw it a lot. Like yeah. I was watching, I'd be watching the NRL and every tackle, I'd think, oh, like, and I'd have to look away and just think that yeah. they, their yeah. leg was going to get caught under like mine did. And mm. so I knew then at some point, like, it was starting to have, like, a bit more of an impact yeah. than I was probably, you know, um, willing to accept. And so then, and, you know, it, was, it wasn't until someone sort of said, look, Drew, you've got, like, you've got a coach for your gym, you've got a coach for your kicking, a coach for your passing, your tackling, all the rest of it. So why not have a coach for your head? You know, like, all the, all the stuff that you go through mentally in your preparation – um, all that sort of thing that you're going through, the stresses and the pressures and things. Like, why is it that you've got to coach for everything else except for all of that, which is probably a pretty big part of our game these days. And uh, I guess when it was kind of dressed up like that, then it made a lot of sense to me. But mm. I think before that, I don't know, maybe it was just that sort of machoism, bravado, male thing that, you know, I don't need that, mm. like I'm fine or whatever. But I actually found it probably more beneficial than, you know, like some of... like any of the other type of stuff I was getting at the time was that like I needed to address it and I needed to kind of allow myself to address it and feel uncomfortable addressing it. But then by doing so, I then became comfortable with it. And, um, you know, cause even my own injury, I couldn't watch that at all for, mm. like for months. And then sort of got to my, I got to a point where I was speaking, um, you know, with this doctor and, um, you know, and after a few sessions and things, we sort of sat down and we watched it and, and it kind of became something that almost became a bit therapeutic for me. I kind of needed to face it. So then I could kind of get past it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it played a big role for me at that time, definitely. And um, I know some guys, even still now, like some guys uh, use it a bit more than others and, and for different reasons as well. So I think it's certainly got a place in, in um, you know, in, in sport, but also I think also I think just in life as well. Sometimes, you know, it's easy to talk to someone that you don't know at all and completely open up to them rather than talking to someone that you think may be judging you or maybe, you know, like because you're already mm. mates with them or you know, family members and things, sometimes it's easier, I find, completely opening up with uh, with people that you don't know at all. And do you take any of that sort of stuff into your, I guess, into your own daily life or the way that you approach competition and stuff like that? Like, have you ever sort of gone down that path of meditation or like any of that sort of stuff in order to to kind of get yourself in check before you, you're competing at these high levels? No, I mean, I haven't gone as far as um, the meditation stuff, but it's certainly something I'm intrigued by. Um, I guess it was, it's probably been something that I've been interested in over the last few years, but going and, and learning how to do it and, and learning, you know, like about it in its in totality. But over in France, it's a little bit difficult when I don't actually can't have much more than a hello, how are you going kind of conversation. So yeah, true. I think it'll be something, you know, once I come back here, I'll probably get into it as well just to, you know, I think also speaking to guys who have retired and, and facing the troubles of coming to terms with no longer playing and mm. things, um, you know, I think it'd be probably something that I'd I'd probably use, you know, a fair bit going forward. So what age were you with the with the ankle injury when you were first sort of introduced to a psychological coach? Uh maybe twenty twenty seven. Twenty six, twenty seven. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. I think you almost need to be at that yeah, kind of age in order to be receptive to something like yeah. that. I think up until that point you're not really capable of sort of 
the cognition of of tuning into those things you just yeah. on autopilot you know you're just fucking punching for whatever that goal is and you just full steam ahead and it's not until like they they talk about you know like people have a quarter life crisis and shit like that and i think there's there's some validity to it in that you get to a certain stage in your latter 20s when you kind of have to evaluate these things and you start sort of getting more of an adult maturity i guess and you and you start to sort of consider these things and go and go down that road and it's like you know you're confronted with like an issue like a trauma like your ankle and stuff like that and it's like you start to see how like i guess i guess when it boils down that's like your ego fucking with you a little bit you know like you've done this injury before so i'm now aware of the dangers that exist in life and that exist in this competition and so your mind's like look at this fucking other yeah. dude he could break his ankle at any second yeah, so you exactly. need to be careful about what's going to happen to your ankle and shit like that so if um you know if you get to that point where you're receptive to somebody helping you rationalize those thoughts and stuff like that must be such an integral part of competition at that level anyway you touched on talking to players that have retired you're 32 years old now do you have anything in place oh, mate, well, it's not it's not something you think you're anxiety. at least, yeah, I, at I least, you, don't, at least no. you don't look as old as cameron smith cameron smith is 32 yeah. and yeah. looks like shout out cameron smith but fuck one of my favorite players in, in uh in nrl but he is pushing 40 at least by yeah. that the, beard and that monkey bum in the length of this <laughs> in the length of this podcast Love cameron, you, cam. cam smith has shaved three times <laughs> <laughs> that, is that not the best five o'clock shadow you've seen in world sport and like has, ever and has Although, looked the what and has looked the same i saw a photo of like some sort of North school Devils boys, throwback, yeah, man. school boys comp with him and uh, Thurston was it? Uh, Cooper, Cooper Cronk and Billy Slater right. all in a North Colts team. That's right, team. the yeah. three of them. The that's three that's of them. rivaling Uni Cam one. Cam Smith doesn't yeah. look a day different, bro. No, he doesn't. No, <laughs> I think he was actually born like that. <laughs> yeah. He's like Benjamin Button. Benjamin Button. <laughs> he's Except a, he's he just a, stays the same the entire time. And he's an Iron Man. If you if you saw Cam Smith in the street, he doesn't look like a footballer. He doesn't have yeah. that. Yeah, jack, and he's somebody like you talk about Pocock just being completely not non plussed about everything like that's yeah. that's Cam yeah, Smith exactly, yeah. yeah I personally don't rate him because he's a Queenslander <laughs> so I, I think the Storm I think the Storm might win it this year I think he'll lead them to that title I've, yeah if, they're looking pretty good you, at the moment have you touched base with much NRL while you've been yeah, back I, we're in oh finals no, fever even, at the minute even overseas um, I get all the, the league uh, live as well as the Super Rugby and stuff so do you, ha- do um, you support a specific team in the NRL yeah I'm more of a Roosters supporter oh, uh, I know this is not a great on, great, great year this year <laughs> it right? hasn't been but the, st- there is, the start of their campaign was so interrupted though too they've really yeah. hit their straps at the latter yeah. end and they've yeah. gone from winning three minor premierships in a row to missing the eight but yeah, I that think, was through um, injury and off-field got indiscretion. Got a good, good, good young squad coming through. I think they've got a couple of um, good young players on, on the rise. Yeah, Napa, but lo- uh, Latrell Mitchell's pr- pretty sharp. Um, we that, a- we that actually name. had a, um, a training session, a live session against the Sydney Roosters maybe a month ago, Wallabies versus um, the Roosters. So oh, we did like our... Um, our you win? Uh, I don't know if it was... <laughs> I don't know if they kept... Yeah, we fucked them. Mate, <laughs> mate, yeah, t- to be honest, I was, I was still in rehab, so I was just watching, but... Um, you know, seeing sort of Wiria Hargreaves and all these boys. Oh. Like they were running their, um, their their goal line attack against our goal line defence and then we'd swap and we'd do our attack against their D. And, um, you know, it was, it was it was interesting because we'd, we'd play with um, with their defence, you know, like back 10 metres or whatever, but then we'd play up on them in their attack, um, you know, sometimes as well. So we'd, we'd be right on top of them. And talking to Piercy and those guys, talking about how much space they thought they had to, compared to how much you know they actually had was um you know it was pretty interesting just uh you know all that timing and that sort of thing um you know i guess the league guys they they've got that that 10 meters before the defensive line whereas in uh within union it's only it's sort of last, last man's yeah, feet so feet. um but it was yeah it was pretty good some pretty good shots and no one no one was holding back so it was, um, as you say too it becomes competition yeah where it's yeah. oh hang on we're not yeah. going to let our guard down against these guys this is it's we're live training here yeah, yeah. so um, no, it was good. It was good. It was good fun. I mean, it's good fun to watch anyway. <laughs> I think Latrell has got a huge future in front of him for an 18-year-old who's yeah. played 26 rounds in the NRL. You could tell it at times during the season it was wearing on his body, but what eight, it's hard enough for the most experienced yeah. campaigners to get through 24 weeks or 24 games of hard competitive. I think footy. also for him, he he moved around a fair bit. He was playing wing. He was mm. playing. Um, you know, fullback a lot. He played a bit of centre and also I think maybe once in the halves as well. So You can see him filling out a la Greg Inglis. I mean, yeah. Greg was that rangy type when he first came onto the scene through North yeah. Devils. I remember seeing him play for North Devils over at Redcliffe Dolphins in Brisbane one day playing Q Cup fresh out of Wavell High. Yeah. And you just knew that this guy was something. Yeah. He was just untouchable at 18 playing A-grade 
it's like, wow. I think he averaged two or three tries a game. P- pretty much. It's like, uh, hey, cotton wool down to Melbourne right now. Yeah, you're in. Straight down, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's funny how there's those, like, even even as kids when you're growing up playing, there's those standout players that you're just like, yeah, this, this guy's going to be something. Like, I remember at... Uh, that rugby league competition that I played in that I got my head fucking rammed into the <laughs> ground. Uh, Dave Taylor was the talk of that competition. Oh, yeah. The Coltrane. And, uh, he was yeah. untouchable. He's, he's actually fucking like, untouchable. He's playing at Catalans now in France. Right. Yeah, in league, yeah. Him and Toddy in the same Him team. Him and Toddy and I think um, Chris and Inu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Willie Mason was there. I think he's, he's now finished now. But Nice. Good, good to see those boys embracing the international yeah. flavour of as well. I mean, a lot of people like, oh, you know, it, they've... They've turned their back on Australian football and things like that. But we've discussed at length here before athletes having a very limited earning potential and experience yeah. potential. If you get 10 years at that top level, you're incredibly yeah, I fortunate. I, mean, I, I think, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, like uh, there's no loyalty in sport and all these mm. days, you know, like with, with athletes changing clubs or changing sports or changing, you know, like competitions that they're playing in or whatever. But I think, you know, like you just have to look at the way, you know, like Robbie Farah, for example, on the weekend, like, there's loyalty both ways and I think it's very easy just to say t- each and every time that there's no loyalty from the player's point of view but, you know, like, Robbie's a one-club man. He's played 247 games for the club and... Bought him their to, only to premiership be, yeah, in the last decade. Yeah, the way, the way it happened. Not, like, we all know sometimes if you're not good enough or whatever, like you're going to get moved on but that's, you know, in some ways that's what people are arguing as well. If, if people aren't happy with the setup at the Parramatta Bulldogs, uh, Parramatta Eels or the, you know, whoever it might be at the time... You know, and they, they go for a better opportunity, then it's the same type of thing. Like, that's the same as a club going for a better opportunity and picking a player that they think is better than the guy that they've mm. got. So it's it's no different in that, but it, sometimes it's it's always sort of it's more glaring when it's a player as opposed to a club moving a player on. Most definitely, and the the international opportunity. I don't begrudge oh, anyone we, for doing we it. We talked about go. that when um in one of the earlier episodes with with the Jaron Hayden Hayden sort of like news of him coming back and everything like that. It's like fuck, man. Go do that shit, you know. Write your own life story and yeah. fucking have a mad time doing it. That's that's fuck fuck pa- the Parramatta fans that are like you're a fucking turncoat or the, or whatever or they, that or that's, in a mess, that like. slayed him about like you know not um the, for signing with the Titans and stuff like that when you didn't even put an offer on yeah. the table. It's like come the, on. The time though that we hear um you know the negative stuff from the supporters. It was only the time. It's only the times where they wanted that player to stay with them. You yeah. know, like you, oh, never, yeah. you never hear them slaying <laughs> some other player that's moved on to another club that they didn't really want. Yeah, you know, they yeah. only ever spray someone that they want, they prefer to be playing for them as opposed to playing against them. Like they don't go up in arms about to the same degree as they did with Jared Hain. Yeah. Yeah. They do about every other player that's left Parramatta. Like it's Fuck only because they want him Bron- still there. You don't hear many Broncos fans going, "Ah, oh, Lachlan Morant has gone to the Reds. Bloody hell, he's turned his back." But <laughs> you know, I'm not not too sad to see him go anyway. But Whatever. And you hear all the Reds fans going, what are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's been a lot of press about that. There has actually. And he's he's had an inter- injury der- interrupted season, so it'll be see, interesting to see how he goes. But, yeah. it's but I mean, you've obviously played like a shitload of union and, and probably, I assume, played your fair share of league and AFL and, and soccer and all that different stuff. When you were like, you know, a kid playing it, at Pine of his Pumas or, or, yeah. or your early days, was it like the end goal was always like, I want to be a Wallaby or was it just, it sort of happened by, um, you know, chance? No, I think, uh, well, I mean, I grew up playing league or like all sort of, you know, like my, my junior stuff. And I only started playing uni when I went to St. Patrick's College, at, you know, when I was 13. So I was, I was playing both up until 17 where I stopped playing league. I think I was playing for Aspley Devils at the time and I just wasn't enjoying I mean, I was enjoying the footy, but it, there was just a lot going on off the field with people's parents and things getting involved and all that sort of okay. stuff. But I just kind of okay. didn't enjoy that in atmosphere. And I was enjoying my time down at Pine Rose Pumas. I was playing club there as well as the school stuff. So um, so I ended up just sort of brushing the league and, and, and stuck, to, um, stuck to union. And I mean, it's probably around 15, maybe 16, when I probably made my first... Um, like Queensland side and then subsequently Australian side from that uh, national championships that it went from kind of just wanting to, you know, what it went from being like every other sort of young kid that played a sport that wanted to play for that national team, be it league union or whatever it might've been to then maybe thinking like hoping it would happen to one day to maybe like, maybe it could happen. Mm. Um, mm. And I think because I had that opportunity to wear the Australian Jersey at, at under 16s, I was like, maybe it's a bit more tangible now. Like maybe it's just like, it wasn't sort of like every other kid that wanted to do it as well. It was kind of like, well, if I 
if I, I, would, I would now be faced with a number of choices and um, you know whether I, I could go to a party or I've got training the next day so I'll, I won't go or whatever it might be that was kind of the point where I was like okay well if I want to make a fist of it then you know I'm gonna have to sort of knuckle down now so um yeah around sort of 16 17 and then yeah then I started yeah I made the Australian schoolboys and seven when I was 17 and then picked up like the actually 17 I, I played that confraternity shield up in where, where were you poon or something yeah Yapoon and um, it's a rugby league tournament. Yeah, rugby yeah. league to- tournament with all the uh, the Christian Brothers schools and um, and I was speaking to Canterbury Bulldogs actually after that um, after that tournament and maybe about going down to their Jersey flag side mm. and then I also speaking to Queensland Reds about getting a, um, a deal with the the Reds College and and I think just purely out of me enjoying the union more of it uh, more so and also people saying to me like it's an international game there's an opportunity for you to go and play around the world here. And maybe, you know, like there's competitions in the, around the world you can maybe go and play. And, and people use the example, you could play in France, you could play in Japan, you could play in England. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, like at that time at 17, I was like, that's pretty cool. Mm. So I sort of, I decided, to, you know, go to Reds College. And then, um, yeah, and then I, like, I guess we spoke about it a bit earlier, then things fortunately sort of fell my way in the early years. And, and um, yeah, I guess I've been able to make a bit of a career out of it. Mm. So how does the international scene work in terms of, obviously you're allowed to play for Toulon. Are you, you're not a, not allowed to represent France because you've represented Australia previously? Had you yeah. not represented the Wallabies, you'd be able to play for yeah, France so conceivably? Basically you, um, once you play a senior team um, at, at a senior team level, so Australian Sevens, Australia A or the, the Wallabies, once you play one of those... Has to be a national team though? Yeah. Yeah. Once you play at that level um, for any country, then you can't play for another country. And if you if you haven't played, even if, say for example, I went over to France when I hadn't played for any of those teams, then you just have to get residency. So there's a couple of guys that um, Australians and sorry South Africans and Fijians that have recently just played for France, right? And they've um, they've achieved that eligibility through residency. Um, I mean, there's there's arguments about about that, you know, whether the people should be able to do it and you know and all that sort of thing yeah. but you know i mean i think that's just part of i guess the world we live in now is people well me and maddie consistently have an argument over state of origin about should it actually be state of origin or or where you're born maddie's mm. maddie's a firm believer that it's where you're born but the rules state first yeah. footy dog yeah i know <laughs> this is true. Yeah, i agree as well i agree like, so long as it's it's hard and fast i feel like because you were born the in origin thing. you're, you're a blues. In Sydney. Yeah, yeah. I'm Did you support Queensland or no, no, in I'm the not, origin? No, yeah. blues. You're a blues. Yeah. Okay. Unless I'm going to fuck. Blues, I'm you feel absolutely that pain outnumbered <laughs> tonight. Yeah. I've got no, three I'm, to one. Unless I've got Just fan. say 10 in 10 years, mate. That's basically all you need to say to us. Yeah, so I really, right down yeah. all the support I need is uh, in Corey, Corey Parker's uh, shoe closet. That many pairs of winning footy boots. Cos CP, he's a fucking legend, man. He's, a, he's, he's, he's hanging them up this year. Yeah. Mate, it, this yeah. could be his last game on Friday night. The Broncos are playing the Titans in an eliminator. Nah, probably. No. Did you see, I, I uh, personally through, did you see that sledge from Sam Thorday through the week? I did. Yeah, that was I great. Did. What was I it? It's one of the great ones. It's just um, that he was he was asked in a in an interview about you know the impact that um, Jared Hayne could have the potential that you know the, or the the potential sort of game breaking sort of threat that he poses and things. And he said, yeah, but let's be honest, he may not even play. He may have a dream tonight and, <laughs> and may want to go and play I think say, he said water, water polo, polo <laughs> or something for his play. Or, um, obviously, he's one of the guys uh, that's sort of a bit lighthearted and um, yeah. pretty witty on the one S- line. Sammy, Sammy won't have any trouble uh, transitioning into a media career once, yeah. he, once he's done Man. with footy. Man, if you're uh, interested in an episode, Sammy, fucking slide right well, into that DM, dog. Local Brisbane guy. You know where to find us <laughs> at Knockoff Podcast. Come and get it. Slide into that DM, Sammy. Couple of cold beers. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's groomed groomed for a media career life after football, Sammy. I think yeah. he'll uh, slot straight into that footy show dynamic nicely. Mate, if, if Fatty Wharton can pull it off, then uh, then no. I think Sammy's Sammy's good. He's hanging, <laughs> is Fatty hanging in by a thread on that gig? And I, I, used, I don't know, to, used to be a footy footy show diehard on the back of Ryan Girdler with their house. I thought oh, yeah. Ryan Girdler is a, a former Penrith Panther and Australian player, and 
was, I think he was just one of the ultimate there's, funny there's, men. There's got to be some stuff that's gone on behind the scenes with that show because because Sterlo gave it the ass and uh, blocker. Yeah, there's got to be there's got to be some uh, some egos at play there. I think even still in 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 the age that those those blokes are sort of reaching. Peter Sterling has transitioned to uh, Fox Sports, career. the number one f- sports provider in Australia. Yeah, so <laughs> he's got got his own gig there on the couch. Just he, a quick one. I went into Fox Sports a couple of weeks ago. I was doing a, a, a little guest gig on um, the rugby show. Commission, uh, uh, public appearance, <laughs> <laughs> four fifths <Four-fifth> commission. commission. <laughs> uh, and then I, I walked in after my show had finished. No, actually, beforehand, I was going in to get makeup done. And oh, you know, <laughs> just a couple of touch ups, yeah. makeup, yeah, 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 at at my absolute request. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That was yeah. Drew's rider. It was the only reason he agreed to the show. Yeah, yeah. I want my, I want an MA, I want an MUA here. You I, touch up these crow's feet. <laughs> like. Oh boy, what are you saying about my crow's mate, feet? We've all got them. We've all got them, baby. Oh, <laughs> mate, they're just smiling mate. lines. I use, I use you Mac. Just a, you're just I a happy use, guy. I use Mac number forty two. Don't <laughs> give me that other shit. <laughs> just, bad, mate, just from all that back smiling, mate. Back to my story. I've got the mic here. Uh, <laughs> Stirlo, so Sterlo just finished his show, but he went straight back in to watch the playback in the makeup room. And so I hadn't actually met Sterlo, but I'd just walked up and he was there with Daily Cherry Evans, I say. And he had his back to me. I was like, you always just watch yourself back to you, mate. <laughs> and he didn't. I, like, it was quite an intense um, interview with Brad Arthur, I think, that episode. Yeah, I've seen that. And he was... In the zone. He kind of gave me like a bit of a glare and didn't give me much. Really? So like, oh. Really? Mate. Yeah, this, but, um, that's got to be us when we <laughs> when we play back this man. Danny and I'll be up to midnight playing this baby back. Like, oh shit, should we dub that out or <laughs> go, fine tooth comb, mate? Yeah, <laughs> uh, unedited peeps. That's it. That's, that's, that's how we're best. bringing it to your raw dog. We've said it before too. That's the best part about podcasts. You can just throw whatever you want out there, and no one's here telling us what to do. We can just sit down and have a candid interview. So, you know, whenever you're ready, Kanye, if I can drop us a line. We're happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> so so how's the groin mate are we playing on saturday oh, i'm not too sure mate. not too sure yet the team list to, to be no but um yeah no it's actually not too bad i went through i got through training uh monday and tuesday and um you know rest day today and um get back into it tomorrow but uh training's feeling good yeah tra- yeah it's feeling good i mean it's i had some complications so i had a um i guess abdominal groin sort of surgery um Maybe back four or five months ago now. Is it in a Monaco hospital? Yeah. I yeah. saw, a, saw a photo you'd sent me. It's actually it looked pretty of, tough. One of the great uh, hospital <laughs> rooms I was in. I actually <laughs> kind of wanted an infection so I could stay a few more days. Um, Ocean view? Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Shit, right over the pool. All the, boot, every, uh, all, the, all the boats and all that sort of stuff. But then um, it turns out I, I had a bit of groin awareness um, going into that surgery and uh, was told to do nothing for six weeks afterwards and I still had that groin awareness when I came back home to do my rehab. And Groin awareness, you mean a, just a, bit of sore, a nagging injury? Yeah, just a bit of soreness okay. and whatever. And they just said that by doing the, the surgery they did, it'll alleviate that pain. And Unfortunately, after six weeks, I'd still had it. And so when I first arrived to Australia, the first day I was here, I got an MRI and they said, well, the pain's because your, your, your adductor tendons detached from the bone. Oh. So you would think before oh. going into surgery, they may have ex- oh, should have explored man. that to some degree. Um and then normally when you go get your groins done, they, what they do is detach your, your adductors, but they do them both. Even if one's presenting with issues, they do them both, so it's all symmetrical. So I'd rip one off, and my left arm was a bit partially torn, but still intact. So we just tried to rehab and try and go on with one, and then it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago and training for the second bled as low that I ruptured the left one as well, which hurt at the time, and it also hurt for probably a week or so. But um, once the bleeding stopped... It just meant that I'd kind of done the surgery to myself, really. So, um, so now neither reductor is attached. And um, so, how do they reattach them? Is it no, screw, they, screws just, and stuff? No, we just let them go. We just go without it. So basically, I've just strengthened everything up around it because of the first one was injured. I uh, I did the rehab on both legs, and so I kind of preempted almost the the left one going. Um, and uh, I've already done the the, the pre strengthening almost before the surgery. Not that I had surgery, but before the injury. Um, so now that once that uh, the bleeding had stopped and the swelling had gone down, I'm actually kind of running better than I was when I only had one attached. So um, yeah, so after basically last week I was kind of doing a bit of a test and not really going in with a great deal of confidence. Mm. We're probably going to go back to France after that, but then it went well and now I'm back into full training and uh, right on. should be right. So go. what is like for you know uh, full time Wallaby squad when you're <laughs> in the middle of rugby championship what's yeah. what's a week's training look like like in in brief monday yeah, so to we, monday well to we, sunday. we arrived sunday and we went straight into a couple of meetings um you know team reviews from the previous game um also a little bit of um 
forward thinking into this week's game about you know some players that we want to play and um, Monday we get out. Also, some of our boys played in the NRC. Excuse me, the NRC over the weekend. So, um, bearing in mind they they still had to recover a little bit. So, um, we train in the morning on Monday with just um, like in units, so forwards and backs, and then we did some weights and then came back and had a team session in the afternoon. Again, all meetings in in and around all that. Tuesday is our big one. So Tuesday we had again uh, units uh, in the morning, backs and forwards, and and uh, and gym, and then in the afternoon it's our big session. So basically you just go and put the uh, the tackle suits on and and it's 15 on 15 and we'll go to different parts of the field about you know um the guy um there'll be two sort of teams it'll it'll change throughout so they basically just give bibs out and it's all mm -hmm. no one really knows what the team is by this yeah. point but you can kind of you know like you're all swapping in and out but that one team will play um the spring box players against the other you know the, the team that's defending and then um and then We'll all keep swapping in, so people, so everyone's seeing what you might get from the opposition, and then also you're playing um, our players against the way that the Springboks defend as well. So everyone in the squad, also in our meetings, will will know how they defend by doing our defensive review and preview. So like whether they've got you know habits of closing on the outside or being soft on the edge or whatever it might be, like a fight strategy. Yeah, mm. and so then, um, but we both we both train it on both time both sides, whether you're for lack of a better example, whether you're training as the Wallabies or training as the Springboks in this occasion. Um, so everyone's seen a picture that we may see on the weekend rather than getting out there and seeing it for the first time. Wednesday, we have completely off, um, other than maybe a bit of treatment and things, but it's just a day to get rest away day. And, and, and relax and rest up. And then Thursday, we'll um, maybe we'll go and have another gym session, uh, another sort of reasonably big session in the morning um, with a team session, which will be contact again as well. And then a slight, um, like a small abbreviated version of a uh, a unit session. Boys might just do line outs. We'll do some some uh, first phase attack or something. And then Friday is our. Um, oh, and we'll also have our jersey presentation tomorrow as well on Thursdays. Okay. Um, and then Friday we just have our our final run. So it usually goes for about an hour. The captain takes that, and we'll just go through all our detail of our kickoffs, kickoff receipts, and and uh, any plays that we want to go over. And then um, who presented your first cap? Uh, John Eels did actually. Oh jeez, uh, yeah, not bad. Yeah, John Eels did. And then when I got when I was like, so when you when you play your first game, um, you receive one of those sort of old school caps, like with the the English sort of tassels on the side. And uh, and John Howard presented me with um, <laughs> with my uh, with my cap. And did he have his Wallabies tracksuit on at the time or no, a suit? No, he had, he had a, <laughs> I loved him for that though. Yeah, he was yeah. just being himself. Yeah, he just had a, a, he had a, a suit thing. and a scarf on and. Uh, and I had to scull a beer because it was my first game, but I also scored on debut, so I had to scull two beers. And it was literally just as I walked off the field, so I um, I was still a bit blowed, and I finished these two beers and and spewed them back up into an esky. And uh, and as I was sort of wiping my face, I see this hand kind of reaching out across from me, and it was um, and it was Johnny Howard to say, "Mate, well done on the effort." Um, more talking about the uh, the, the drinking at this time yeah. because. He'd already shaken, shook my hand for um, for for the game, but that was in Sydney, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in Sydney. Yeah, and then um, we were at that game. That was that yeah. was unreal. Yeah, it's good. Managed to bag one on yeah. debut as well. Scored yeah. a try. Actually, got that away from Brian Abenner. Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. hopefully, see a little bit more of that on the weekend. There it is. From you, you were just about to say that. Yeah. There and it so, is. are you like like going back to the training? Like when you get home from that day, are you? fucking shagged are you hitting the sack like yeah. i'm done for the day yeah or well last night i mean I'm, that's how intense it is i'm rooming at the moment with uh with nick phipps um the halfback from the waratahs and um last night i was literally just laying on the bed and i was mid conversation with him and and i just went <sighs> and just sort of knocked out for about maybe 10 minutes and i woke up and i was like and i was like did I just go, you know, when you kind of like, you've been in yeah, denial, yeah, like, did yeah. I just go to sleep? Like, nah, nah, you nah. were snoring? Nah, yeah. fucking wasn't. Yeah, no, it wasn't. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then it was at that point, where I was like, man, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much done and, and put my little um, eye mask on because I like to sleep with my eye mask yeah, on. Yeah, there you go. Sort those um, crow's feet out, dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I find that if, if, I've got the, yeah, I've got, if I've got the eye mask on, it means I'm not reaching for my phone. It's sort of like it tells yeah. me, okay, that's it, I'm done. So yeah. even if my phone's right next to me, I, like the eye is mask it, Isn't that fucked, man? I find like my phone is just pervasive these days. Now that we were talking about flip phones and shit like that earlier, when you, once you switch to a, a smartphone, it's like 
you've constantly got this second little brain with you that's yeah. like answerable to any question that you have and i was watching some shit on the tv like sitting on the couch and uh it was a report on like hackers or something like that and i was just listening i think it was a four corners report and i was listening to like the, the little introduction that the lady was doing and she was like many of you like the majority of you actually watching this television program right now will have a second tablet or device within arm's reach and i look down and there's my phone i'm like shit she got me yeah and it's just like listening to you know listening to podcasts and music and just the the constant flow of media that comes from this little device that's constantly with you it's like you feel naked without it eh? we're also sitting here talking now there's two laptops and four phones on the table yeah exactly (laughs) talk about irony uh, (laughs) just a uh, classic question that it's always asked on the interviews with um with the uh, pro football players and it's normally done in jest as a bit of a stitch up but any uh, classic uh, classic roommate encounters when you go on tour? Yeah. Have you got any people that you... Would <laughs> yeah, best, best and worst. It's like, <laughs> oh, I drew that name. Oh, no. <laughs> these are the ones we, where... We just want just full names yeah, under yeah, the bus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. These are the ones where you don't put them in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, couple, don't have to give names, but just examples. A couple, n- <laughs> couple of nudists. <laughs> many, many nudists. Yeah, I know. many nudists. I've actually become quite comfortable nude now that I've been over in France. I think um, it's about time too, mate. Yeah, it's thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just got to accept this is this is all I've got. This is all this I've is be- ever becoming a recurring a theme have. on this podcast. Yeah. You had Chris's gay photography website <laughs> story, and now Drew's about to drop some knowledge. No, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think, um, well, for for the most part, the majority of my sort of well, second half of my career, I've always sort of room with gits. Um, on Wallaby tours and then also in France, I, I room with him whenever we go away. Um, but I, I think it's it's pretty important. I th- some coaches come in and try and you know reinvent the wheel and say no, you got to be uncomfortable and you're going to have a new roommate every week. And I think that's just bullshit. Like, you know, we're we're, we're forever getting ourselves uncomfortable at training. Mm. Um, you know, you got plenty of time in and around the hotel to kind of you know interact and do things. You got to have one place where you're comfortable, and that's you know like going back to your room and sleeping and all that sort of thing. If if you don't know necessarily know a guy that well, you might be kind of you know like really different in that you go to sleep really early. I, I'm a you know I go to sleep sleep quite late. Um, you know small things as well. Like when you're traveling to South Africa and jet lag is an issue, and you know like once you're awake you're awake kind of thing. Like Gits and I kind of had like a few like rules that were just non-negotiables. Like phone was on silent and it was facing down so the light wouldn't you know flash up. Yeah. Um, you sat down to pee so then you didn't have to do you didn't, <laughs> I love that yeah you, it meant that you didn't have to turn the light on and it also meant that you didn't piss in the mi- like in the middle of the water <laughs> mm. so because those little things can wake you up as well definitely um, must be what it's like for two gay dudes to be married <laughs> <laughs> like when you think about it, like you would have to establish Sim- ground rules. And I, <laughs> anytime I've got a, I have a uh, pregnant partner at home. Anytime I'm waking up in the middle of the night, it's important for her to get the uh, eight hours. I'm sitting down. I'll yeah. hand on heart. Yeah. I'll Mate, I also think it's actually just better to kind of stay in that twilight sleep zone, just to it s- sit down yeah. and still kind of like, yeah, you know, tease yourself a bit with the, the closed eyes. And yeah. I've been sitting. For there's years, nothing. Wor- <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing worse though than in the middle of the night and you uh you think you're taking a whiz into an open toilet and you hear the drrrr, <laughs> you just straight seat. <laughs> or picture frame on the wall because you're full horse at that time. Like, yeah. oh, whoops. Look. Uh, um, but no, I mean, I think. I haven't had too many. Um, well, none that I'm probably capable of talking about <laughs> so much. <laughs> That's playing on. But um, I remember one time Tamana Tahu, I was reading T- Tamana, used to obviously play league with uh, Newcastle and, and Parramatta um, for a long time, but played for the Waratahs and the Wallabies as well. I remember rooming with him and he preemptively told me that I wasn't allowed to um, relieve myself in the room because he didn't want the, the rooms smelling like a brothel. So I was like, well, what are, you know, like I'm over here for a couple of weeks and... You know, I'm, I'm yeah. a bloke and whatever, and and um, he just said, "No, nah, not allowed to." Wow, <laughs> it's a sacred, sacred place. Yeah, mate. Wow. Speaking of things smelling like a brothel, me and Maddie were driving through Brisbane City today, past the Universal Lounge on uh, Mary Street. Shout out is a uh, gentleman's establishment who must have just received their order of disinfectant for the week or what <laughs> looked potentially like six yeah. months. Yeah. <laughs> but we're out ta- out the door, I'm talking like. 30 litre tubs of Eight pi- to ten pink of and green disinfectant. And we were like, I've never been in the establishment, but uh, 
That's that's a lot of floor coverage. Straight up. It, w- it wasn't the best look. Granted, there wasn't a lot of clientele at that time, but if I'm walking past, I'm not heading straight into that darkness. Like, and we've, cov- we've covered an, a lot of ground on this podcast. Done a we've, solid 90 minutes. We've previewed, we've gone back to basics, grassroots, Drew. We've progressed into game week, Drew, heading into Springboks campaign. The cat wasn't fully let out of the bag, but I don't know if they're talking about some contact and things like that. I don't know. We might see you there this weekend. If you are, my friend, I wish you all the best. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Absolutely appreciate the time. You're in a test match football week. You've taken time out of your schedule to help us expose who we are and get this podcast off the ground. You've played footy all across the planet. I'm sure that contacts listed in your phones coming out your ears, <laughs> but... Thing I respect about you most, mate, we've known you for a long time now. And you've never forgotten where you've come from. That's no worries, absolute That's credit, I am. absolute credit to yourself. Good bloke, hard worker. Absolutely. <laughs> Th- thanks for coming on, Drew. To all the Wallabies boys, we hope you do well against the Springboks this weekend. Go get them, boys. If you head back to, Lo- back to Toulon after this campaign, I wish nothing but the best for the boys in red and black. Uh, Drew Mitchell, thanks for your time, brother. Really, really appreciate it. No worries, guys. Thank thanks you. very much for having me. Enjoy. Cheers.